little message that pops up that says um, that there is a privacy policy that you're agreeing to, um, and then you, it's at the top of your bar. So welcome everybody. I am Julia Forsyth, the Associate Director from the Center for Pedagogical Innovation. I am so happy to see you for session two uh, for teaching large classes. I'm joined by my colleagues who I'll introduce in a minute, but first I wanted to acknowledge um, it, we, it's been something we have been amiss because we've been at home and haven't been thinking about it, but um, it's actually really important, especially in this time, for us to acknowledge that the, the land that I'm on currently right now, I'm in St. Catharines, is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and um, Haudenosaunee peoples who live and work and are part of our thriving community today. And we're so, um, we just want to acknowledge that and that um, um, as part of our commitment to decolonization, that these are things that we want to consider not just as an add on, but um, as part of everything that we do. Um, so just want to make that acknowledgement now. And I will uh, introduce my colleague, Alisa Cunnington, who um, will be kind of monitoring the chat to make sure that if there's anything that's not right on topic that she can answer in the chat. Do you want to say hello, Alisa? Hi, everybody. And then uh, my associate, oh, sorry, were you going to say more? I just like, no. For you. <laughs> okay. And then uh, my great colleague, uh, Madeline Law, is the Associate Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning, and I'm going to pass the baton to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, I'm just going to move right along so we can have lots of time at the end uh, for questions. So again, thank you for those who are attending for the second time. And if you haven't been here uh, before, I put a link to where you can access the workshops uh, from last week. As well there, you can access any of the other ones. So if you're teaching a fourth year class, there's a session about that. We also have um, a session on using the lessons tool. So there's a whole bunch of different things. So it's a good link to check out to get things uh, get things moving along for all of your courses. Uh, but today, we obviously are going to be focusing in on the large class teaching. Our agenda is uh, to really think a little bit about uh, your learners and uh, where your learners are kind of at and, and really grounding your thoughts about your course design into uh, who your learners will be. Uh, we'll just quickly breeze over the integrated uh, design refresher. So one slide just to, you know, again, get thinking about how do you chunk things and really pull everything together. And then uh, lastly, we'll focus in on uh, planning with your learners in mind. So in just listening to what everybody's been really asking and thinking about is um, and this idea of how do we chunk material in a meaningful way that is engaging for students and allows them to really get into the content in the course and doing so outside of synchronous big lecture, which as you know, we are saying, please do not do. Uh, we, we know that uh, these are going to be things that will be very, very difficult technologically, but also for your learners. And so we're really trying to provide you with those supports around the chunking of material. But what we also know is that if we can't have that synchronous uh, approach with our students in the big lectures, how do we foster uh, a good collaborative, online, engaged, feeling engaged with your colleagues or, and with your, uh, your classmates for those students? So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So on the next slide, this is uh, where we're at. So our roadmap, just as a reminder, last week we just did big broad overview. Today we'll do a little bit more of a deeper dive and provide you with some more really cool examples of what other professors have been working on. And then in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll dive in a little bit deeper to course learning outcomes and then assessment, and then really thinking about planning and uh, solidifying your approach to get working on your courses. I think so I'll just jump. One. I'll yeah, just jump ahead. in quickly at this point to say uh, I did receive a little bit of feedback about how these sessions are going, and I just want to uh, reiterate that you're always welcome to just uh, reach out individually because we're happy to consult you um, based on your specific course. This is really just a broad overview and an opportunity for you to experience the team's environment and also to get a broad spectrum of things. So. Um, the, what we've done today was based on the feedback you gave us in the etherpad last week so for those of you who weren't here we we had collected some of your information about what you were interested in so this is designed that way sorry madeline i'll pass it back to you on that yeah oh, that's awesome this is what we do <laughs> so we showed this slide last time and uh we wanted to just think a little bit more about this idea of the who are your learners what do you want them to know what do you want them to be able to do and to value by the end of this course so 
on the next slide, we, we looked at uh, the Etherpad and some of the things that you said, but also just started thinking about, you know, who are the learners going to be in these large first year classes uh, or just larger classes in general? Um, so again, that's just a little contextual piece. You might be in a third year class with students who are a little bit older, more mature. However, there's still a, a number of these components that I think link in. So generally, there will be a lot of novice learners. Uh, the need for scaffolding to really foster that independence. Um, we'll just go, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I thought I did it. Um, so the other piece too is that we know that students are really going to miss this social component. That's, you know, probably one of the number one reasons why they come to campus is uh, to hang out with friends and be with friends and also to engage in, you know, a lot of higher level thought around these topics. So they're missing that. And some may be as young as 17, which is scary when I think about that in my child. Um, and also what we, we know about this generation is that a lot are focused in on the social media, they're social media consumers, and they're used to small chunks of information. They're used to YouTube videos, they're used to Instagram and TikTok. And I'm not saying that's a mediums that we need to be using, but what I'm thinking about is, you know, how are they really consuming information and how do we, we push them a little further, but also make sure that we're catering our information into chunks that will be super engaging for them. Um, another piece that came up here is that you indicated that most will be credit seekers and a combination of majors and non-majors. So some people are going to be dealing with really different types of, um, of learners in your in your large classes, especially in that first year. So on I the next slide, oh, yeah. I know and at this point I'll just jump in. I'm going to keep interrupting Madeline's because we're didactic that way. Um, uh, there are a lot of additional resources, uh, things uh, that I'll be adding to those additional sites. So uh, there's a lot of research behind the, the chunking of material, et cetera, that you'll be able to find if you want some sort of evidence or guidance on how to do that. Okay, sorry. Awesome. No, nope, that's all good. Um, so the next slide is uh, really focused in on just that integrated course design. Again, thinking about what are your learning outcomes? What are those activities that you can create? And then how is the assessment all linked in? And on the next slide, we know that we also want to think about um, designing for your learner, but then designing uh, with these kind of factors in mind. And there's a link down there that I thought was a really interesting read. It was about um, designing kind of from a, a trauma lens. Um, and we know that a lot of students will have some loss in, especially in that first year, they're losing out on what they think society says first year university should be. And so we really want to be able to design our courses to make sure that they have some predictability so that um, they still feel really connected to the university. So predictability being something where you're creating a really structured schedule for them each week and they know what to expect. Flexibility, uh, engage or ensuring that you're engaging regardless of where they're at. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. How can we really foster communication and, and collaboration and connection and relationships within uh, this experience, but also having some way in which we're able to empower them within their learning. They're not just receiving and maybe putting in a few forms, but what else can they do that allows for some level of control over the uh, activities that they're engaged in? So I put this little uh, table together that uh, just has some really quick high level ideas. Uh, but hopefully you're, you'll be able to build on this and think about how these concepts might apply into your course. So in terms of predictability, um, structuring lessons the same each time so that they have an overview, they have here's some readings, here's a video, here's a forum, and here's a quiz. You know, if you can set things up in a nice structured way, they really know what to expect moving forward. Um, also, if you're asking them to do a big assignment, do you have any examples that might be helpful for them to really think about? The flexibility piece, this asynchronous is, again, what we're really thinking through and saying, you know, is there a way for you to provide that information in a way that they can do it whenever it suits their, their timeframes? Uh, I also put in here around, you know, under being understanding about extent, uh, ex 
extensions. So we know that uh, this is a hard one, really hard one sometimes, uh, medical notes, and there's all those pieces, which will be, uh, again, quite challenging in this environment. But is there something that you can put in there that, you know, the one uh, department has used this idea of two days of grace on assignments. So they have two days, they can be late uh, on any assignment, but it's like only two days through that whole semester. Again, just an idea, extremely hard to manage in a large group, I would think. However, if you're having TAs and they're marking the assignments, is there a way you can build in some of this flexibility knowing that something might come up when they're living at home? They might have to take care of a, a family member or you know, something might just happen in their environment. So flexibility, I think, is important to think about. Connection. Uh, it doesn't have to be synchronous, right? So your your asynchronous connection uh, connection could be a 24 hour forum chat. So you have one day every Friday, you just have to post one or two things that day, but at least you know that you might go on there and there might be a few other people and you could be responding in real time. Uh, or it's just provides that, that flexibility around the whole entire day for international students to engage, but you know that that forum's happening on one day, as opposed to feeling like you have to follow it all week long, which can be uh, quite a bit of work for the professor and for uh, seminar leaders. Uh, virtual office hours for the prof and the TA allows them to stay connected, thinking about potential group projects that they would be able to collaborate on, as well as uh, some examples would be looking at online communities and peer tutoring and motivating and pushing your or nudging your students to move in those directions. The last one there is about empowerment. Uh, so this would be things where allowing students to decide when they complete the material each week. So again, having that asynchronous environment allows them to feel empowered to say, yeah, you know, Fridays are my day that I do, you know, Psych 1F90 or and this day is the day I do this. So they're able to build their own um, kind of and feel empowered in when they're engaging in that material when it's right for them. Uh, and then there's just a, a few other examples there, but a reflection on assignment material is definitely uh, a really nice way to keep them engaged in that way. So on the next slide, I, uh, Julia, you want to talk to this one? Yeah, this will probably look familiar to Astrid. And I do want to kind of give a bit of a shout out to actually a lot of the participants in this room right now who have a lot of experience with this, who could probably be leading a session exactly on how they've designed their online um, courses because they've been doing it for quite uh, many years. So Astrid, uh, in working with Rick Chiel, this is an example of um, Rick designing predictability into the schedule and then giving a visual map for students to know when things are due. So Thursdays are these key day that these big things are due and it's color coded based on when expectations happen and it uh, we found like from the first year to the second year when he he added this map and it really solved a lot of the confusion around um, uh, when students were you know knowing when they had to do things so like coming to class gives that kind of a headspace oh Thursdays uh, 10 to 12 or when I have to go to class but if you actually take that headspace of oh Thursdays 10 to 12 or when my uh, assignment is due or my quiz is due so building that structure in and I just love this visual um, representation that Rick's given us permission to share um, and I do want you to kind of you know look at the other people in the chat and maybe reach out to them if there's somebody that's uh, you're interested in the way that they're doing something because Astrid has been teaching facilitating a thousand people courses for quite a long time now um, and then this piece yeah um, so somebody in the chat though said uh, must we include a final exam for first years and then please don't uh, I think about it as a virtually proctored exam um, I think there's a way in which you can make uh, like an open book uh, multiple choice or short answer uh, type of exam but knowing that it's an open book type of uh, activity uh, we also know that we are testing out a number of platforms and we've never really had uh, a situation where everybody's had to be online for big, huge exams uh, across all sorts of different courses. And so we're really trying to motivate people outside of that and say, what else can you do? What other types of assessments? And we'll get into that in future uh, sessions. Some really cool alternative types of things that you could try out. And uh, I just want to I just want to note that there. Uh, for those of you who've been here a long time, there used to be into the handbook that first year, uh, like it was a policy that first year university, like they did have to have an exam, but that was removed at least five years ago. So you don't, you do not need to do that. It's entirely possible to rethink and be more imaginative about your assessments for sure. Sorry. 
go on. Awesome. No, no, thanks. Um, so then in terms of uh, this slide, I found this article and I, I just re it was a really interesting read from my perspective. It was about a student who moved into being a, a teacher professor and really looked at his education and saying, you know, I was kind of sick of sitting there listening to lectures. But, you know, how could he as an instructor uh, think about these three C or the four C's of critical thinking, communication, collaboration and creativity? And instead of just transmitting those facts, being able to energize students to become active learners, even in an online space. So this really resonated for me in saying, how do we curate all of that great information and bring it together in a way that makes sense? So I put this slide together just as a, a, a kind of thought of, okay, if I walked into my class, so the next slide there, Julia, which, um, you know, what do I do normally in that kind of a big, uh, big lecture space? And I used to teach the HLS or the Health Science 1F90 course. And what we would do is we would do an intro of what I was thinking about we would do today. So instead, if you think about it today, think about it as like this week, this week in our lesson, uh, what will you be doing? And, uh, you know, even a small intro video on what that lesson is going to be about that week. Could be one minute it just with the overview they see your face it's just a really quick thing and then you think about in that lecture so in my lecture i would generally you know i would sometimes there are things well and not sometimes but a lot of the time the, and i look at all the people that are here today you have amazing expertise in your research in your areas and that's really what the students want to hear from you they want to hear the, the neat stuff that you do or, or that you know and your perspective on it so I think what needs to be said, say it in a video with a PowerPoint voiceover, but if they can watch a video to learn about some theory from somebody else, or they can read that somewhere else or hear about it on a TED talk or whatever that is, how do you bring that in as a different learning experience for them? So what needs to be said, do it in a video, what can be watched, allow them to watch it, and what can be read, let them read it and provide the guidance and uh, around why you're asking them to read these certain uh, articles or documents. And then that helps to provide them with that context. And then the other way of, and then the last piece I would say of ch chunking it is ensure they got it. So can you do weekly forums? Would it be uh, weekly quizzes that they engage in so that you can make sure that, not make sure, but you can help to motivate them through the content to uh, with some level of an assessment or a reflection or a forum. And so, I just wanted, yeah, yeah sorry, I was gonna go jump in and say that like a lot of um, the etherpad comments said, you know, there's a lot of anxiety about planning you know, when you have an F course, it's like 24 weeks of content. And so talking to people who have done this before, you know, that doesn't necessarily all need to be built right away. But whatever you do now actually completely alleviates the teaching. So I was just talking to um, Dennis Soron, who's teaching sociology one of 90 in the spring. He has 240 students in it right now. But because he did all of his front end loading, he said, oh, yeah, teaching it now is just is, is going so much smoother. Um, and so you did ask for examples. And so I want to show some examples. But I do want to also share some of these, um, I think, really good insights that can be helpful that you could build your structure, do your content chunking, and you don't necessarily need to build everything all at once, right? So just sort of start with the framework and then you could fill it in. And some of those things that Madeline is saying about like, put a little video of you um, weekly just to check in something that's happening currently, you know, that can be done on the fly just to keep that presence going up. It doesn't need to be like a huge production. Yeah. Awesome. Just interrupting you. I'm sorry again. I, I want to uh, <laughs> speaking of sociology one of 90. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, 40 of the most popular large first year classes have open textbooks that are available from eCampus Ontario. So sociology one of 90 um, is an example, I think. Yeah, so he basically a uh, dentist took um, he didn't want to use the entire textbook. You often you don't use an entire textbook. You choose selected chapters. So he took the parts that he wanted with attribution and just put them in lessons. Um, so, you know, instead of reinventing the entire wheel, he put his personal touch because he has his lens. Some of it he didn't actually agree with, but he was like, some people think this. And then he could put a little video and say, I, uh, this is what I think. What do you think? And then it was a prompt for more discussion. So there's a lot of um, material out there that is already chunked for you. Um, and so you could look at how that's being done and they're already open, they're text and copy and pasteable. So please feel free to check it out and please contact me if you're interested. It's a big passion of mine is, uh, is helping um, students lower their costs of, um, you know, of teaching, of learning on campus. Sorry, Madeline, I'm 
passing it back to you. I just muted. <laughs> so uh, the other piece here that we know has been really important and we, we already talked about it is that building those relationships and having ways in which students can be collaborating together and having small group uh, discussions. So we created this little continuum. So the from the, the one end to the other is really just saying that you can create things that are really not, I won't say simple, but are uh, things that you can enable and be ready to go. They're in Sakai, they're embedded, and you can move all the way up to team breakout groups that we're still really kind of testing out and seeing how those all work out. It's working for my master's class, so I'll, I'll let you know. But what you want to think about is, can you use these forums as that, uh, you know, 24 hour uh, asynchronous seminar where we can group students into forum groups and they can respond and discuss specific topics and questions. But if you're like, oh, I kind of want a little bit higher level, maybe a little bit more interaction, maybe you could create the ether pads. And we had an example of that last time where students do have to go on at a certain time. They don't have to use video. They don't have to use anything else, but they go on and they collaborate in that space or they could collaborate there over time to create something. The middle one is where you might say, OK, my first year students, they have a group project. And then the students get to decide where they get to go collaborate. So they might like to use uh, Office 360. They might like to use Google Docs. They might go and use whatever. Uh, I find they're the most creative at figuring that out. Maybe they use FaceTime to collaborate. And that's okay, as long as you don't need to be part of um, those conversations. Uh, the word, so I, the next one would be Word online group documents, which could be embedded within their whole entire Brock ecosphere of uh, suite of tools, and you could be engaged with that. Or again, team breakouts, uh, that's something that you can set up their sites, you can be part of that, they can, you could go into meetings with them through these groups, they can share documents, they can do video, there's a ton of different things they could do there. But what I think is really key here is thinking about how many people you have in your course, thinking about what your course learning outcomes are, and which one of these kind of types of small group or collaboration make the most sense to achieve your learning outcomes. But that's something that's going to make you feel comfortable as an instructor in terms of your workload and uh, the engagement that you feel like you need to have with your class. And I think that's a, a really important thing because, you know, at first I was like, hey, let's just put everybody's seminar in teams and make it work. But that it we can we can make that happen with the seminars and students can be in there, but it does take another level of comfort within the technology that I think you will need to think about as a as an instructor. And I'm just gonna, building on that. So Louisa is asking about why we were recommending. It's not that they're recommending, it's actually a spectrum. So Etherpad is built into Sakai. You just it's a matter of turning it on and clicking add, 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 and you can create a, any number of Etherpads right in Sakai. And so the management of that is is a lot easier for you. So it's it's sort of like how fast you want to get up and running. Whereas if you're going to create Word docs for your students, um, I've had I've had people they create they create them so that they can see what they're up to. Um, if you're allowing students to do it, then by all means. And it really depends on what your outcomes are. If there is some kind of like report that they need to do in Word and that's more appropriate, then definitely do that. It's just a matter of setting up all those documents, sharing, getting the share link and ensuring that you're following what's going on is a little more management uh, for, for you, but it's definitely not per preferable. Yeah, okay, good, I'm glad that makes sense. Um, and so one of the things that people asked were from for examples. So I'm trying to pull a bunch of different examples of what this looks like. And a lot of the big uh, questions were about engagement. Um, and I think we want to show a lot of examples of how forms can actually be quite that gets a simple thing to set up and it can do a lot of the things that we need. So um, uh, instead of doing the uh, so somebody said I'm, it's like learning from the fire hose. <laughs> so I'm going to we're going to try and just like keep it simple and we're just going to show you some examples from the forums. Madeline, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Did you have something to say? No, you keep going. OK, yeah. So um, uh, so forums are threaded discussions. So that's what's different between forums and uh, Etherpad. So here's an example of using forums to just to build community. There's this first uh, session in uh, Sociology 190 is just, hey, just introduce yourself and tell us how you're going to be prepared for this online course. And this is moderated by the TA. Um, they're all set in uh, very um, 
specific uh, seminars, so they're in group clusters. So um, so even though it's a class of two, um, I put 200, but it's actually 240, um, they're still in these little groups of 20. So it feels like a small class to them. And, they're, and the TAs are supporting them all the way through. So uh, the introductory message was given by the TA. He's like, hello, here I am. And you'll see later on when they get into the content, um, how, how that gets structured. But it can also be that social space where people can add some things. And it doesn't need to be only text. Again, it goes back to what your learning outcomes are so you could be doing hey uh put do a photo uh send a um you know a mind map or uh, or a little video can be done in there and they can do a one minute video introduction yes it's quite easy and uh i just discovered last week that there's an app for your phone and so this week in my course i actually just recorded on my phone hey hey guys this is this week's and you just pop it in there and my students knew that already and they were using it in forums already so it's um it's pretty straightforward and and kind of uh, a great way to think of different ways that you can be using the forums which are threaded versus the etherpad which is sort of like a collaborative document so think of like a collaborative essay or a collaborative like when you're going to write something together is when you would use etherpad whereas the forums are um a discussion so if i'm going to say something like this is a getting to know you activity which is happening here for building community the other way it can happen uh this is an economics course that i helped um tony ward who it's his birthday today happy birthday tony um he's retired but his um he used this as just as an accountability for group work um, so it was, he put these in groups of five, they signed up for the group. So he had a large class, he had only one marker grader. And this was just a way for him to just say, you know, you have to do this group work, use forums. Um, I'm gonna just check in. There's a way that you can just check to see if everybody's done it, yes or no. He didn't, and the accountability was on the student to report back what they contributed, but there was this um, mechanism that you could go and check. So if somebody said, you know, so-and-so didn't help in the group, you could be like, oh, that's true, they didn't. But if you set out your expectations from the beginning, it's possible to do that um, as, a, as a great way to kind of alleviate uh, the tracking and monitoring if that if you don't have a lot of those resources. I mean, ideally you have a TA for a group of 20 and then you can really foster deep discussion. But if that's not built into the course, there are a ways around that. You can make the students accountable for their activity. And um, back to um, discussion. So here's an example in uh, political science. Um, so the question is laid out and then each seminar has each of their things. So there's a, a question for each week. The way that uh, this is Charles Conte's course, the way he set it up, because his courses, his questions aren't exactly, um, you know, a debate. And a, so they're designed almost that it, you benefit from seeing everybody else's answer, but you definitely should write your own before you see other people's. And so there's a checkbox in forums that allows you to post before you have to post before you can see other people's response. So that kind of uh, cuts down on the academic integrity issues and the kind of uh, very superficial answers that people say, yeah, what she said, I, I agree with that. Um, so it's, it's another model that you can use to design the discussion. Uh, oh, I thought I had one more example, but basically the other one is, um, is if there is kind of a controversial topic and then um, designing really good questions. And we'll be talking more about that in assessment and I'll be posting a lot of those resources in the small the interest group about assessment so that you can see all of those great things about how do you construct a really good question that fosters that kind of um, uh, discussion in a seminar. OK, back to you. <laughs> awesome. And I just saw a great um, comment from Netta. So thank you for that is, you know, that that clear, clear uh, direction for TAs and what that looks like. And we have had a ton of TAs show up to our online workshops and continue to uh, have amazing uh, turnout with those. So we are uh, proactively getting students or TAs ready for online. We will also have some uh, they're called instructional support assistants that will be assigned to each faculty and we'll be doing a bit of a needs assessment to see what you want your TAs to know so that we can start building some of those resources as well and kind of in a in um, a specific yet generalized way so more to come on that but uh, definitely a topic that I think we should dive into a little bit more here uh, now moving to that idea of connecting with your students so again I think a lot of people were saying you know I just need to have that synchronous lecture so I feel 
connected and they feel connected to me. But there's a lot of different ways they can feel connected through this forums. But there could be, as uh, Julia was saying, just a professor's weekly reflection video. Um, it could be two to three minutes and it could be things that they've heard from students that week in the forum. And one thing we know that uh, students love is like when the professor or when somebody is like, hey, and I heard this from one student. So if you could get permission from a student with, who did an amazing post, those are the kind of things that really help them feel like, okay, they're listening. It's not just like a canned course that I'm taking. So I think having those uh, are, that's a really, really nice way for the students to feel connected to you as the prof. A professor's blog. It doesn't have to be long. We know, you know, 100 to 200 words talking about, you know, here's a topic we did this week. What is something cool that came out in the research this week or you saw in the news or, um, you know, the current issues that are happening? And how can you just speak to that in a really quick uh, written blog? And I think, Julia, you said somebody had used that through the announcements. They did weekly announcements about here's something cool that happened this week related to your topic. And so, again, making them know that they're connected in real time within the course. I, I put one here too, and I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not great on Twitter, I'm working on it, but uh, you can also set up um, a Twitter account and you could post two or three th interesting, interesting things each week that the students could uh, follow. And you, know, you could even build in a reflection on that if that was something you were thinking about. But again, using sort of those creative ideas, small chunks that let them feel engaged. And those are some of our, our, uh, some of our suggestions. Yeah, and these can be done, you know, as the term goes on. So it's not like you need to prepare all of this stuff too. So some of this can be roll out organically like you used to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this slide, uh, it just speaks to the different ways of making instructional videos. We talked a little bit about this last week, but it keeps coming up everywhere. Uh, so it just gives you an overview of Universal Capture, which is available, uh, PowerPoint and Teams and all the different uh, activity or I guess techniques and activities that you can do with these. So it's uh, you want to be in the video, you want to capture multiple types of images, uh, you want something that's Brock supported as well as easy, uh, that's easy to pick up and use mostly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I think with PowerPoint, you just can't go to different things. You can put screenshots on and that, but using universal capture and teams allows you to kind of flip back and forth if you were trying to show like a spreadsheet or go back to um, your PowerPoint or a website. So you can do that in those, record it, upload it, and you're good to go in Sakai. So I, just, next. I want to address uh, the time thing. So I'm going to reiterate that a little bit of time now saves a lot of time later. Um, so it and that you could just do the framework. You don't have to get everything in place. So it doesn't need to be perfect perfection, you know, but you kind of want to have this framework in place so that it comes uh, together later. Um, and then Astrid is asking which one, which app I use to record videos. I've been doing a combination of things. I use all these things. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right I, think, I think I've used all of them too. Uh, with Teams, what I've been doing is bi-weekly expert uh, interviews. So I actually do interviews with somebody and then I upload it and that's kind of like my weekly check-in with everyone. And I use Teams, I invite them in, we videotape it and it and then it goes straight up. So uh, yeah, there it's worked really well for that kind of uh, engagement, but definitely I've used all of these, I think. I just want to uh, a point that Dennis made about um, doing a synchronous lecture and why he would avoid it. He said if he had a class of a thousand and he and he said you can guarantee a hundred of them won't be able to get online at that particular time, and that means a hundred emails of people being like, "By the way, I couldn't." And he was just like, "Oh, you know, just it's much easier from the outset to just be like, watch this video, and then let's connect in other ways uh, throughout the week." And so the management of that is actually much simpler, and then um, and the engagement seems to be still pretty good. Yeah. I think too, and I'm just kind of reflecting on, and actually, while you, if you want to pull that up, while I'm just kind of reflecting on how I've structured my course right now, I had um, four weeks that were ready to go right at the beginning, except for like my weekly things that I needed to just add in. But then once I had that structure in place of, okay, it's a heading here, and then I'm going to do this, this, and this. 
I just started to build the rest of them kind of as it goes. And then I start to like, I'll open them up at the beginning of each week, but having that structure allows me as the instructor to say, okay, I need to find a reading on this. And I might just come up with something that I don't need until August, but I have it and I can just put it right into my Sakai site. So having that structure just allows you to, to kind of manage your, your time. I don't have all my lessons ready for July. I really want to get on that, but um, it is something that if you're only really releasing them one a week, you can work on it the week before, as long as you're, you have that structure set up, I think is the key. Sorry, did you want me to pull up this site or your site? This site. Okay, I have to change my share, change my share. Uh, I am now sharing my desktop. Yes. Okay, yes. so this is, my, this is actually Mike's class. So for those of you who like Mike, Mike Brusso, he teaches um, interactive arts and science, 1PO2. And so uh, interestingly, he did a, he had his labs um, as, a, as a, just a kind of drop-in session where if people were having problems with their, their computer program that they were writing, they're able to check in and they could share their screen and show some of the things that they're doing. So that was the synchronous um, connection part, but everything else was designed through the lessons tool over here. So we're just showing you another way that lessons could be uh, laid out where each one he has, um, he chunked his lecture videos into short uh, ones based on topics. So normally in class, he would have probably had a lecture that covered all of these things, but you know, they're actually different topics. So he, he chunked them into, you know, each of one is following the premise of being under, you know, eight minutes. Um, and so just concise and to the point, you know, and then the rest of it is just sort of looking at the, the tasks and um, uh, providing the slides where necessary. Um, he's actually got quite a lot of video in here and then links um, and then he links to what the activity is for that week. Um, I think that was it for the um, the sharing. I could keep sharing, but I think what we'll do right now, I'll just pop back. When you share your screen, you leave Teams and that always kind of um, jars me a bit. OK, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop recording. And then I think we will um, at this point.